Good morning, good evening, good day, and welcome to Drama Buds. I'm Francine, I really love K-dramas, and I'm going to spend as much time as I want talking about them. Welcome to my podcast. So before we start, I just want to go through like all my reactions to the Big Sang Arts Awards. Uh, first of all, we got the date wrong. <laughs> Apparently, it was one week after we posted that uh, predictions or that Big Sang Bets uh, podcast episode. So, okay, whatever. We had to wait a few more days, sadly. And okay, let's go through the winners of like... First, let's go through the movies because I watched a few movies or I know about a few, like the winners of, what was it? Blue Dragon that was earlier this year? Yeah. Anyway, so I watched Samjin Company English Class just earlier this week and I'm really happy that it won Best Film even if, you know, technically it was just second place after the Book of Fish. I I think I got that right. Um, But hey, they won Best Film. So... I'm happy. It was a really fun, fun movie to watch. Um, I was surprised that Jon Jong So won as Best Actress for the Call, given the strong competition. I mean, you know, she was against Kim Bae Su and Moon Sori, who they're the ones that I have watched before and that I know of. So, to me, I mean, it's Kim Bae Su. I really didn't expect Jon Jong So to win, but. She deserved it. She totally carried that movie. She was uh, really good in the call. So, go girl. Um, I'm also so happy for you, uh, in uh, for breaking the streak of old men winners <laughs> in the best actor for film. Like, first he broke that streak in the TV category for uh, Six Flying Dragons, right? He broke the streak of old men. And then it went back to old men. And then Kang Hanu broke that streak and now it's back to old men. But later on that. And um, now he broke the streak in the film category. So Yua In is really the leading actor of this generation. Really, I'm I'm amazed. I'll watch Voice in Silence. Voice of Silence, sorry. I'll watch that movie on Netflix over the weekend or something. And... Okay, I'm also happy for Kim Soon Young for transferring from Best Supporting Actress in TV to Best Supporting Actress in Film. We we love a queen. <laughs> um, the rest of them, I don't know anything about. So those are my movie reactions based on my very limited knowledge. Okay, now to TV. Um, I was mostly right. I can be proud of... I'm proud of that. I was mostly right. Like, honestly, the only ones that really mattered to me were Lee Do Yoon and Oh Jung Se. Like after they won, and the first one announced was Lee Do Yoon. My heart, you could feel it like beating against my chest. Also for Oh Jung Se, but yeah. After they won, I didn't care. Like you could you guys can go crazy, fight over your awards, like how they did in episode whatever of Penthouse. <laughs> I still remember that. Anyway. They can do whatever they want. I don't care. Oh Jung and Lee Do Yoon won. Let's all go home. Um, so happy that Yum Yeran won Best Supporting Actress. Like she really deserved it for the Uncanny Counter. I just didn't know about all the other nominees, but totally deserved. And it was so nice to see all the actors from when the Camellia blooms together. Oh Jung Se, Kim Sun Yong, and Yum Yeran in that. Uh, on that stage, oh my heart! And then we'll see them again next year, cause Oh Jung Se and Yeon won, so yay! Okay. Um, also really surprised that Flower of Evil won Best Director, but but then as I was thinking about it, you know, the weakest point of Flower of Evil for me was the screenplay. It was the writing, but the acting and the directing were both really good. And you know, for the director, like he really maintained the. The emotional resonance, those feelings in the mellow side of Flower of Evil. And then he also maintained the suspense in the thriller side of it. So yeah, good director. I, I, I'm okay with that win. Um, biggest surprise for me was Kim Soyeon winning for Penthouse. But, you know, I didn't watch that show and I didn't take it seriously. I will acknowledge that. I don't know if she was that great. 
or if like the clips that they showed of her were really just the overacting clips but eh whatever she won I'll give it to her and like the other candidates though I was rooting for Shin Ye Sun I I was rooting for her not because I really thought that she's such a best actress winner but like if I had to pick a girl so okay Wait, I'm kidding. The actual biggest surprise was Yu Jae Sook winning the day sang. And not It's Okay to Not Be Okay or Beyond Evil. Like, oh, okay, it's time to talk about It's Okay to Not Be Okay, which just makes me so sad. Um, Earlier today, or in the day, <laughs> I realized that Kim Soo Hyun wasn't going to win Best Actor. Like, I, I realized it. No, it's not going to happen at all. It's kind of similar to... You know, Park Dong Hoon in My Mister. Like, My Mister as a show was just so solid, so great. And although Lee Son Kyun did really well in, in Park Dong Hoon's role, and, you know, his personal characteristics, like his super deep voice and his sad face, um, it elevated the role, right? But in itself, it was just a simple role. Like, there are more complex characters out there. And yeah, so that's kind of. What happened, I think, to Kim Soo Yoon and Kang Tae. Like, he did really well. So, so, so well. But, like, as a character, Kang Tae was just, you know, the quote-unquote boring one among the three. But, okay. Ah, gosh. I'm really, I'm really shocked that It's Okay to Not Be Okay got snubbed. Except for Best Supporting Actor. I mean... Okay, fine. Let's do it. Let's delve into it. I feel like Soyeji's controversy had some role in this. Like, it's a good thing that all categories had, you know, Beyond Evil or another close competitor. So it wouldn't be too suspicious if they didn't win anything. But I seriously think they deserve more than two awards. Which, the other was costume design, okay? Okay, for, for Best Supporting Actor, like, Oh Jung Sen not winning would be so questionable. Like, I feel like people would, like, audit the, the critics panel or whatever, just to figure out why didn't Oh Jung Se win. It was just a landslide winner for that category, so they couldn't, you know, they had to give it to him. Uh, but the others, it's like, let's, I'll just give my two cents on, you know, the whole Soya G situation. I don't condone that behavior from any human being, not just celebrities, okay? If you know what she did or like how, what people say she did or whatever the text said, like, the description of that relationship, I do not condone that. Not just from a celebrity or whatever, just from any human being. However, I think that she is in the worst position in this situation compared to the guy. Because the other guy, because the guy, he'll just apologize, he already did, and, like, somehow his career will recover. While she, you know, it does not look good at all for her, for her career. Um, it's a disproportionate response. Like, everything that happened in that situation and how the public reacted to it. But, you know what? It's not my culture for me to dictate how they should respond to issues in their country and their people. And uh, I'm also kind of annoyed at those saying that she should have just gone to the ceremonies, you know? She didn't do anything wrong, right? Why is she hiding? Like, why can't she just show up and show people that she's innocent or that she deserves to be there blah 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 like no it's just it's just not how it works like you know some say not going is an admission of guilt but it's not it's not an admission of guilt because first of all we already her agency already confirmed that she sent those texts so at this point what can she really apologize for you know she could apologize for i'm sorry for being a terrible human being you know if, if that's how she wants to frame it but there's just the, there's no need for admission of guilt, okay? Like, she could be, quote-unquote, sincerely reflecting as most public statements do. But whatever. Also, second, I just... This is not America, okay? Or the West, where if someone shows up after a scandal, people will be like, oh, she's so brave. She's so strong. She's keeping her head up despite all the attacks. Like, over there... I guess she'd get a decent amount of hate, but also a decent amount of support from those people. But it doesn't work like that in Korea. Okay, she might get attacked, like physically attacked, even more for just showing her face. And like neither is right or wrong. Okay, 
some genuinely guilty people, whether they did something moderately problematic or actually terrible, they get praised, right, for showing up and being strong and brave and having the courage to pursue their career and their art and whatever. And we know that they did something pretty terrible, right? And we don't like it when they, you know, they have no shame at all. We don't like it when people are rewarded for not having shame, right? But in this case, she did something pretty bad, I guess, and it affected someone else, and that person affected a large group of people around him. And yet, it it still feels like a disproportionate response for something that happened years ago. But again, neither response is right or wrong. And it's not up to international fans to dictate how a culture whose media they're consuming should be. Like, it's not up to international fans to, to tell South Korean culture to just let her free, let her have a career, let her win, whatever, and this and that. Like, both of those responses, being overly forgiving and overly critical, are harmful to different groups of people. Being overly forgiving is, you know, harmful to the victims. Being overly critical is harmful to the person who's, who they're criticizing. And you know what? Neither, neither is right or wrong. It's called cultural relativism, guys. Try it sometimes. It's hard. It's hard to understand other cultures when you're so ingrained in yours. But, but try. Okay? Neither is right or wrong. Anyway. Anyway. Let's, let's end that. Anyway, I would genuinely say, though, that all winners deserve their awards. Even if I think it's okay to not be okay, got snubbed. You know, the categories that I think it deserved to win the most had good winners. And really what matters most is that Ojong Se and Lee Do Yun won. So, thank you and back to your regular programming. So hello everyone. On today's episode, we are going to talk about the only Park Ye Ryun show I genuinely liked. Yes, I finally found a PHR show that, you know, no ifs, buts, or maybes like minimal criticism of course it's not a perfect work but i could say that i genuinely enjoyed the experience and yeah i it has value <laughs> um so today we are going to talk about i hear your voice uh 2013 drama drama uh i watched this with not no expectations low expectations i i really did not think this was going to be good because of you know phr's like next works but to my surprise it was a good blend of fantasy and like a legal drama and it wasn't as romance heavy as the other phr works that i've watched speaking of romance it has my new favorite second lead mr cha and this is the first time that i rooted for a second lead way more than the male lead but I also understood why he wasn't chosen. I wasn't mad. It was okay. Um, although this show used the trope that I hate the most out of every trope out there. I'll explain that later. You know, I liked the characters by then and the story around them. And by the time it was introduced, I just accepted it and I got through it. And the overall experience was fine. So what is this show all about? It's about a high school student who can read minds and an unsuccessful attorney who they're both in danger because of a murderer who is plotting revenge against them, which is a very bad description. There's a lot, I mean, not a lot more going on, but th they go through more things than that. But okay, so let's talk about the plot and the characters. First, we have Park Suha, played by Lee Jong Suk. So he is the high school student who can read minds. As a child, he witnessed his father being killed by Min Jun Kok. And that's when he started, he gained the ability to read minds. So in the trial against Min Jun Kok, he almost got acquitted. The killer almost got acquitted. But that's when Jang Ye Sung, who's a high school student back then, that's when she entered and testified that she saw him kill Suha's father. So Jun Kok swore to get revenge on both of them. And ever since then, Suha fell in love with Yesung and promised to protect her from him. So years later, he's a high school student now. He meets Yesung as a public defender. 
But at the same time, Min Jun Kook is released from prison and they have to live together to protect each other. So because of his ability to read minds, uh, personality-wise, he's a lot more mature and empathetic and sensitive for his age. But honestly, that's all I could say about his personality. He's really just like the protector and the love interest of the more interesting character. Even if he's the one with the superpowers, okay? Like... He's less interesting than Jang Ye Sung, played by Lee Bo Young. So she is the actual star of the show, thankfully. So she and her mom used to work for So Do Yun's family, played by Lee Da Hee, as housekeepers. But because an accident that hurt Do Yun was blamed on her, they were kicked out and she got expelled from high school somehow. So, at that age, they were in high school. Um, she witnessed the murder of Suha's father with Do Yun. But only she testified against Min Jun Kook in court. So eventually, she took the GED and then she studied law. But when she became a lawyer, she's pretty unsuccessful because she's lazy and she doesn't trust the people she's defending. And then, you know, her mother told her, like, you have to pay me back for the money that I threw away because, like, Doyon's father paid her off to you know, go away. Um, and she threw that back at them. Anyway, so she encouraged Ye Sung to just apply for a public defender position. And then she got that. It's a higher paying position, but it's in another city away from her mom. So Ye Sung really only does this like lawyer thing for the money. Like it's not for justice or righteousness, which is the direct opposite of her new co-worker, Cha Kwan Woo, played by Yun Sang Hyun. And in that, uh, in the court there, that's where she meets Doyon again, who is a prosecutor now. And both of them are, you know, constantly going against each other in court while also kind of grappling with their regrets from that day in the courthouse. He has some regrets opening that door and testifying and, you know, now having a murderer coming after her. And Doyon regrets not being brave enough to do what Hye Sung did. So Yesung as a character is just full of contradictions. Like she defends people, but she doesn't trust them and would never go like the extra step for them. And she used to barely even put in the effort for her clients. Like straight up in the middle of a trial, she'd be asking, like, so is your mother dead? Uh no. Is she is your mother sick? Uh yes. Uh the defendant is just uh struggling to earn money for their sick mother. Like the laziest possible defense, straight up in front of the prosecutor, in front of the judges. Like she clearly is putting no effort in defending her clients. But you know, when she does put in the effort, it's not really for their own good because she believes in them, because she wants to uh protect them or you know, set them free from these accusations. No, it's it's for her own ego. Like if she's worked, if she's against um Doyon in the courtroom or whatever, like it's it's not for the defendant. It's for her. So Hyesung is like she's a little bit cr- cranky, disagreeable, arrogant. You know, like fake arrogant and all that. Especially with her mother, who kind of acts that way to her too. So it's kind of just how the relationship works. And Tia Song is just full of pride. But her journey as a character is about letting go of that pride and learning to do the right thing for the sake of it. So, um, so Cha Kwan Woo, Yun Sang Yun's character, and So Do Yun, played by Lee Dahi, they're both listed as like the second leads of the show, but I'm not gonna bother describing them. <laughs> you know, they're, yeah, they'll be described later. So what did I like about this show? I really, really liked Lee Bo Yong as Chang Ye Sung. Like, she is the only PHR female lead that I've actually liked. Because, I think it's because most of her female leads are like goody two-shoes characters. So it's like, yeah, you know they're goody two-shoes. And so you always have to believe like, oh, they're always morally right. Because they're the good guys, right? They're the ones we should trust. It's like they can never do anything wrong. And everything they do, it's always um with good intentions in mind. So it's like there's no there's no moral failure necessarily. You'll always believe that they have the best intentions. It's nice to see someone colder and more complex 
I mean, complex being not just a goody two shoes and not just because, you know, a lot of things are going on around her and she's dealing with those. Like, it's all external complex stuff. This time, it's internal. Yeah, she actually gets an internal journey of being a better person because she doesn't start out as a goody two shoes. She's not just a plot vehicle who needs to deal with the things going on around her. She has things going on inside of her. And because of her complex personality, even some of her professional wins are actually personal or moral failures. And she grows from each of the cases. Like, I remember, I think it was the second major case she dealt with, where, like, okay, she had... she. I think she was just going against So Doyon and she wanted to prove Doyon wrong. Or... Some prove Mr. Cha wrong? I don't know, but it was just about her ego. But it actually, what, what, what she actually did wasn't for the good of the defendant. Like, I totally forgot what this case was about. I'm serious. But I just remember her boss telling her like, okay, you got that uh, ruling or that decision from the judges. But that doesn't actually help your client's case. It, ac- it will actually make it more difficult for them to be acquitted. And so, like, she got the win because she got what she wanted, right? But she wasn't doing it to help the case of her defendant, of her client. It was just to prove that she could get it done. So, yeah, she eventually grows from that. See, it's interesting. Like, yeah, she got a win. But was it really a win if in the long run you made things worse for your client? Ah, oh, I I really like her character and all the things that she deals with because of her personality. Uh, Lee Bo Young's performance is good. Like I don't know if she was actually the best in her category when she won Best Actress in the Big Sang Arts Awards in that year. I I don't know. I haven't watched any of the other shows then. But yeah, she did pretty well. She delivered everything well from the pettiness and shallowness of Jang Ye Sung to. You know, her vulnerability and her confusion as she was dealing with all of her struggles. Um, I also really like Yun Sang Yun as Cha Kwan Woo. He is the best second lead. He's my favorite second lead so far. First, you know, he was just a comedic character. Like, the, he's the goody two shoes here. He's the, I will do things for the good of the people, for the good of my clients. I will defend them to the death because they deserve to have someone fight for them. And his personality and values are completely opposite from Yesung's. Um, because of that, Yesung looks down on him and thinks he's, you know, he's naive, he's easy to manipulate, he's not going to, you know, win in court. But he's actually successful as a lawyer um, because he can empathize with his client, with his with the defendant. His wins inspire Yesung to try to see things, you know, his way in the slowly contributes to her growth and then she slowly starts to fall for him because he's you know he's funny but when you see him in court it's a little inspiring it's a little charming um so she slowly starts to fall for him really and then as soon as he's given a chance like she really wants to pursue something with him and he confessed to her and all that something in the story happens and you just know that it's impossible for him to be given a second chance it's Oh, this part of the story like killed me. But, you know, um, it shows how all those good traits, like it's not bad, right? To believe in the people you defend, to be good and righteous and to work really hard to believe in the innocence of your defendant. But all those good traits can be manipulated by people with bad intentions. But he's not a bad person for sticking to his principles, right? That's the big moral dilemma of his character at that point in the story, which I really, really loved. You know, he's my favorite second lead because I like second leads that actually have a chance. Like, they're not just constantly pining after the female lead or antagonizing the other lead. You know, he he was given a chance. He got it. But the reason why he couldn't be endgame, even after the big incident, there was also a, a time skip after that. So maybe she would have had time to cool off, right? To forgive him. But it was just too personal and too um too intrinsically linked to his deep moral beliefs and his principles that 
it was just never going to happen. It was deeply linked to the plot and it made sense with their characterization why she could never forgive him and give him another, you know, chance romantically. It wasn't just because, like, even if it's frustrating that he had to be, you know, beaten up by the plot this way, I'd prefer that instead of, you know, oh, she'll never see him that way or because he never actually tried, that's why he'll never be given a chance. Like, no, he tried. Yes, she saw him that way. But something really happened that, you know, shook the, the relationship to the core and things were, you know, changed completely after that incident. In the end, his, you know, unflappable kindness and righteousness, it got toned down. But he's already influenced Yesong to be better. And he's still kind of that, you know, the paragon of righteousness and goodness here. And, you know, in, re- in relation to Suha, he also influenced Suha to be a real adult. Like, not just someone pretending to be strong and mature because that's what he's always wanted to do, right? To protect Yeso. But you're not protecting her by being a jackass. <laughs> so be actually mature and decent and that's how you can protect her. If you really want to be seen as like a serious romantic candidate or whatever. So we've brought in Park Suha. Now I would like to talk about what I didn't like about this show. Honestly, I didn't like Lee Jong Suk's character that much. And the thoughts I had on him, like the slight <laughs> the slight thoughts I had about his personality from the initial description, it just came from others' opinions about the show that I read online about his character. But it's not from my actual viewing experience. Like initially, I was just going to say, I don't know much about his character at all. I just know his role in the plot. I find myself comparing him or Park Suha to Lee Jong Suk's character in Pinocchio, Ki Ham Yong. Because they're kind of similar, like traumatic past, intelligent, but hiding it or hiding why he's so smart. And then there's this childhood connection with love interest. I'm sure I can think of more, but I just, I don't really know much about Park Suha, honestly. It might just be Park Yerin's formula. You know, I've talked about these tropes before, right? She's probably also used this for other Lee Jong Sook, the other Lee Jong Sook character while you were sleeping. Who knows? I haven't watched that yet. But okay, back to the comparison of Pinocchio versus uh, I Hear Your Voice. At least with Ki Ham Yong, the Pinocchio character, he had more relationships, like with other people around him. So I could create a picture of his character outside of his relationship with a female lead. But here in I Hear Your Voice, he barely has any friends. He has no family. The only person he's really connected to is Hyesong. And then Hyesong is connected to her mom, to the killer, to her office mates, to the people in the cart house, to the people from her past. Like, Hyesong is the one with the intricate web of relationships. And then there's him who only cares about her and like maybe one or two friends in high school. And then no one else. So it's like you are, he's really just a love interest. With a little bit of characterization, but mostly a love interest, a protector. By the way, no problem with Lee Jong Suk's acting, okay? Like, he was mature and sensitive, but sometimes he was just on the verge of turning dark and violent, like, on the edge of that. And it's Ye Song who brings him back to the light or whatever. Like, yeah, Lee Jong Suk is perfectly fine. No problem with him. Another, another problem with the show that really just, it put my watch experience to a halt. Like it almost, I almost dropped the show halfway through because they introduced Amnesia. Imagine this, I watched eight episodes straight in one night at at 1.5 times speed (laughs) because I couldn't stop. Like I, I couldn't stop. I had to keep watching. I had to know what would happen next. And I loved everything so far until the halfway ish mark. When Suha, you know, got into a fight with the big bad and got amnesia or he vanished. And then when we found him next, he had amnesia. I I was so, I was ready to just go to bed and never pick the show up again. Because it's the trope I hate the most. 
Like, it's so cliche that I feel like I don't even need to tell you how the other characters reacted to his amnesia and how he slowly, you know, all the confusion of like, how do these people know me? What do they know me as? And then slowly, you know, recovering his memory suddenly and then keeping it a secret because he wants to maintain how she takes care of him because, you know, she thinks that he's still a helpless uh, amnesia, whatever. Yeah. I've described it to you and I'm sure you can give me other examples of other shows that have done it the exact same way. I don't... Oh, I hate Amnesia. But I stuck. I stuck to the show. I just said, you know what? I've enjoyed enough and I hope that, you know, this will end in like two episodes so we can go back to the good stuff. And thankfully, it was resolved in a few episodes. And then it went straight into the love line. And this part... I wouldn't say I didn't like the love line. I'm neutral to it. Totally neutral. It's like, yeah, I liked Mr. Cha, but yeah, the thing in the plot happened and it was impossible for him. And I knew walking into this that, of course, they were going to... It, of course, the main leads had to be in the love line. What was... <laughs> Nothing will change. It's only 2013. No one's revolutionary yet. Anyway... So about the love line, uh, it just felt so unbalanced, I guess. Maybe Yesong stood out too much for me since every character was linked to her, right? And she was his only link. And he just felt like a romantic interest. I mean, if you're into, you know, puppy love devotion, then this will work for you. It's perfectly fine. He's totally in love with her, totally devoted. He'll protect her to the ends of the earth. He'll risk everything for her. Okay, if you're into that, go. But eh, I just I just wasn't. Because, you know, his only character trait is that he's, well, you know, he can hear people's thoughts and um, he has a, he's trained all his life-ish for the past 10 years to be able to protect her. And now he's protecting her. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know. Okay, I'm glad that they had a time skip, like a year, so that he wouldn't be a high school student anymore. And there were no icky situations, even if he was living with her in his like last year in high school and stuff before the time skip. Mm, but at least based on what I remember, like there was barely any romance between them at that point. Like obviously he was pining after her, but she was she was still into Mr. Cha, right? And that was going well, right? Okay. Um, my problem is that I don't know when she really changed her view on him. Like, from seeing him as a high school kid to now seeing him as a potential love interest. I don't know when that happened. Like, was it a gradual change? Or was it, you know, did it just suddenly happen? I, I really can't tell. Suddenly, after the time skip, when he was, you know, legally an adult now, somehow she was just okay with it. I don't know. You just have to believe that they have the childhood connection and they've been through so much together and he's an adult now, so it's time to fall in love. Okay, whatever. I have no energy to question that anymore. You know, some say the chemistry was good, but I didn't really notice that or pay attention to that. And I assume that Lee Jong-suk has chemistry with everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, so... I would like to compare this to other Park Yerion works, right? I have to because I've been dunking on PHR for so long. I have a two-hour podcast just dunking on startup. But, you know, for the first time, I actually liked something that PHR wrote. And it's the oldest one I've watched. And the worst one is the newest one I've watched. So she's just getting worse and worse with each show. But, but okay. So, as I was watching Zhang Yesong, I realized that she is the template for Dalmi in Startup. You know, right? Quirky, spunky, confident, does weird things when they're stressed. You know, been through, wasn't able to finish their studies, but pushed on to... Well, Dalmi finished her GED. Good for her. But she didn't pursue anything else after that for some reason. I don't know. I don't understand. Why didn't Dalmi go to school? Her house is so nice. 
I don't understand. I will never really understand Dalmi. But sorry, yeah. Uh, even the Dalmi in J dynamic is from Yesong's dynamic with Doyon. Like how Doyon's role was really just a foil for Yesong. Um, and then no, actually, I like Doyon. I like how Doyon was treated by the show more than Injay was treated by the show. Cause like Injay went from Dalmi's foil to Dalmi's prop, right? And Doyon was yeah, he, she was Yesong's foil, but she also had some regrets over what happened in the past. Like she wasn't completely okay with how those things happened. She wasn't. I mean, she was smug about it, but you could see that a little bit of that was petty and fake. The way Kesong was petty and fake. And she was also really important to the plot at some point. Um, so yeah, Doyon is a better character than Inje. Or Doyon was treated better by the story than Inje was. But same dynamic, just the foil to be there. Who's barely there, doesn't really have their own on like continuous storyline throughout the show until they're important or until, you know, Hyesong needs a rival in the courtroom, Doyon doesn't show up much. So, okay. Maybe, maybe PHR was trying to recreate Jang Hyesong since she's still currently her best female lead. But it was either the acting, you know, and or the writing of the show that fell flat. And by the show, I mean startup, okay? Like, something just didn't click the way Jang Yesung clicked in I Hear Your Voice. At this point, I don't know if I like Jang Yesung the most because of the writing or because it wasn't Park Shin Ye or Suzy. Oops! Look, I don't think I hide that I'm not a fan of their acting, so I'm sorry. I've watched enough of, well, I. I've watched a few of their shows and I'm just never impressed. So, yeah, I'll put it out there. And then when they went to the PHR roles, which are pretty simple roles, like it's not that hard to play Choi Inha and Dalmi, okay? And yet there was still something very unnatural about them. And maybe I'll blame it on the writing to, you know, help them out. But Jang Yesong. Well, Jang Yi was just a better character. Yeah, I'm kidding about all that criticism. It really is the writing that makes me like Jang Yi the most. Okay, okay, let's let's go into it. So Choi In Ha, a Park Shin Ye's role in Pinocchio, she comes off as really whiny and weak, and is the ultimate damsel in distress. Like, okay, she has strong moments, but in general, I. I don't know. I really just didn't feel her character. I mean, I, I pitied her at some times. But I didn't really think, like, she could do much without other people's help. Yeah, okay. Anyway. And then Dalmi, you know, in Startup, she doesn't seem to be faced by anything or fail at anything in her life. And it isn't really explained how she manages to make it through all these extremely external problems. Like, it's not about her changing her attitude or her viewpoint. It's really things happening around her or like challenges in running the company that she doesn't know about. And it's, yeah, it's just not about like, oh, she has to be a more patient person or she has to be more um, stubborn about what she believes in. It's not really about that. Just like magically, she knows what to do or someone comes in and solves the problem for her. So I think Jang Ye Sung is an improvement on all of those. Or because she's the first one, everyone else is a regression. It, they regressed after her. She's the template and they all regressed. So Jang Ye Sung is not a damsel in distress. Like she clearly knows that someone is coming after her and... Yeah, he's probably around, lurking around nearby. But she has a job to do. She has a life to live. She can't live in fear. So, okay, she'll accept the help from, of course, the police and from Suha and Kwan Wu, whoever, whoever wants to come help. But she has to keep going with her life and keep working. You know, she's not going to stop everything out of fear and just wait to be saved. I don't know. I like that. She is a little similar to Dalmi in that she almost always succeeds, right? 
But at least we know that she went to law school and is actually equipped to make it through those cases, right? Because she studied law to be a lawyer. Okay, basically, she's not magically a lawyer the way Dalmi was magically a CEO. Like, she didn't just spot a bunch of laws and, you know, was given a t-shirt saying lawyer. No, <laughs> I don't I don't even know what the process is to become a CEO at this point. Oh my God, I'll just shut up about startup. Ugh, we already know what I feel about that show. Okay, moving on from the female lead comparisons. Let's talk about the big bad in Pinocchio versus I Hear Your Voice. Um, I won't include startup here because startup is supposedly more character driven, right? So there wasn't really a big bad except for... Alex, I guess, and Yong Yong San, who tried to kill Ji Pyong. I don't. Th- there was no big bad, and the big bad will kind of just appeared, did the bad thing, and then vanished because he did his job. He made Dosan confident and, and turned him into Steve Jobs. Okay, moving on. So, big bad in Pinocchio versus I hear your voice. Um, in I hear your voice. It's literally someone coming after them. So they really have to be the ones to deal with it. Like, this guy is relentless. He's not going to leave them alone. Like, they have to deal with this issue. They can't just ignore it or tell others to take care of it. But in Pinocchio, I kept asking myself, why do Choi Inha and Ki Ham Yong have to get involved in everything? Like, why does it have to be them who serve as the plot vehicles? I feel like the plot should be motivated by the characters. Like the plot of, you know, Min Jun Kook coming after uh, Suha and Hye Song. He is the plot and they motivate him, right? To come after them. That will be clear if you think about it. But, you know, the characters can't just be dragged around by the plot. Because it feels like in Pinocchio, it's just like... It just it was a very meandering show for a long time. I think... Because I Hear Your Voice was so successful. And Pinocchio was also very successful ratings-wise. Um, I feel like they just said, well, we have 20 episodes. Let's do it. Let's just meander. So that's... It just really felt like they were plot vehicles being dragged around by the plot. And the internal journeys, I don't feel it all that much. Uh, I don't know. Okay, I I know I'm overly critical of the others, but that's because I Hear Your Voice is the only PHR work I genuinely like, despite its many flaws, despite how dated it is. So that's that's it for me today. Okay, I, you know, this is a perfect example of how coming in with low expectations can actually help you like things more. And if... PHR has done it before. Why can't she do it again? You know, this was plotty, but it had a really interesting character, singular. <laughs> she did really well with one. Uh, some argue that they really like Tuha. Okay, sure. I really like Mr. Cha. And, you know, despite the how the plot just pushed him out of Yesong's life, um... It made sense with his character why he had to be the one in that difficult position. Okay, it totally made sense. Um, yeah, it everything was done pretty well. And if PHR wants to try more character-driven non-fantasy shows, it's possible for her to write interesting characters. But she also can't completely drop the plot or introduce things out of convenience that don't really make sense. Because it seems like you know, when she drops the plot and tries to focus on the characters, there's just no plot. Like, the plot, you know, just falls away with one wave of Dawson's magic hands. Ugh. Do you get me? It's like there has to be some stakes here. Like, let's amp it up a little bit so that it feels like when they fail, there are actually severe consequences or like more intense consequences because it doesn't feel that way. And her characters are also not that compelling. Ugh, I don't know. You know, after watching three PHR shows, I can confidently say that she is, 
a mediocre writer with some strengths who tried unsuccessfully to branch out of her comfort zone and, and away from those strengths. And yeah, she's mediocre because it's been three works and I really couldn't say that, oh, this was absolutely stellar. It's like, no, this is the best of what I've watched. But I wouldn't say it's like stellar, stellar. I'm still going to watch While You Were Sleeping just to make a final, final verdict on PHR in her shows. Like, maybe this is really the best. Because like, I've been watching it from worst to the best. Startup, Pinocchio, I Hear Your Voice. Maybe While You Were Sleeping will be the best. Or maybe because it's, you know, Susie, I'll hate it again. Who knows? Um, back to I Hear Your Voice. I still enjoyed that show. Even if it was flawed. And I think for its time, it was already pretty good. Like that was, you know, 2013. I feel like classic K-dramas at this point were from like 2011 to the 2000s back. And, you know, the modern stuff was like 2016 or Goblin Descendants of the Sun onwards, right? I feel like that marked this revolution in K-dramas. And that middle portion, it was weird. There were some masterpieces. Missing was released in 2014. Hello, Missing. You made it to this podcast episode. I managed to insert you here. Um, but, you know, in general, the works in that middle portion, it's like, it's too recent to look and feel that dated. But it's also a little too old. Because it hasn't reached, like, the K-drama revolution of 2016, I guess. So, yeah. That was a weird period. But for its time, it's pretty good. I don't know if I'll recommend it. But, yeah. Decent enough. So, that's it for me today. Thank you for listening. And I will see you soon. Mm-hmm.